Well, this morning, our goal is to accomplish two things. First of all, it's to acquaint us with the biblical story that was highlighted in this drama that you just witnessed. And then as well, to apply uh, the truths that we have in this story. Because in the Bible, stories are not just stories. Stories contain in them significant theological implications that are transformative as we engage with that truth. And so if you have your Bible this morning, I invite you to uh, follow along with me and turn to Luke chapter 2. And uh, if not, we do have the text on the screen. And what we want to do is, is walk our way, first of all, through this text so that we can have a full understanding of what's going on uh, from the drama that you just heard. And then, as I said, to uh, apply it. We begin in Luke chapter 2 at verse 8 where we read this. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields keeping watch over their flock by night. This same country is somewhere near Bethlehem in the same pasture area where David centuries ago attended sheep. And we see that there are shepherds that are doing this. It's very important that we understand the significance of, of what's happening here with the shepherds and the fact that it is those who are called shepherds who are the subjects of what's happening. Who were they? They were people in that day who were on the bottom rung of the social ladder. Uh, there was a caste system, and that, that reality still happens in a lot of countries today uh, where you have you know, different, different segments of the culture, of the society, and some people reside on that lower level, and that was exactly what it was like to be a shepherd in this day. As far as religious status went, um, their work made them ceremonially unclean. They knew that they were social outcasts. Well, note here it says that they were out doing this work of keeping watch over their flock by night. In the Bible, it's important that you understand a lot of times when there is a reference to night, it's not just talking about the time of day, but rather it has and it conveys theological implications that are being told to us. And that reference of it being night now sets us up for an incredible contrast that takes place in verse 9, where we read this, And behold, it's a word of, of being stunned. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them. And so we see here there is, there is an angel. It's only one angel. And, and note in light of the result of just one angel all of a sudden appearing before them. Behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were greatly afraid. God's glory, and here this, it's talking about br brilliant splendor that's associated with the a, with a majesty and presence of God. It's, it's talking about that Shekinah glory of God, the visible manifestation of his presence. It was something that, that no one had ever seen in that day. What's the result of that? Well, they were, they were greatly afraid. Uh, that, that word literally means terrified. It, it, it is literally, they feared a great fear. It was, it was intense. The old King James Version of this account says that they were sore afraid. And really, that conveys it as well. It's, it's talking about a fear that is so intense it hurts. And so they, they, they are just absolutely petrified as to what is in front of them. But note in light of their fear, how the angel speaks to them. He speaks to them in verse 10, assuringly, where we read this in verse 10, then the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. He tells them of the fact that there is coming the reality of joy. 
And that joy that he's talking about is not simply glee, but rather it is about the reality of the fact that people now can have a deep-seated sense of satisfaction when they know that their life is rightly related to God. And this reality of the experience of, of this kind of satisfaction is going to be to all People. It's made available to all people. There's not uh, just an exclusive few. It, it's, it's to all people individually and racially and ethnically. No one is exempt from the great opportunity that is being announced to experience genuine satisfaction. Well, we go on in verse 11. We see the basis for this, this great joy where he says, for, here's why, for there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. He's saying now, right now, today, God's saving purpose now has moved from promise to actuality. And so this day, there are three titles given for this incredible announcement of this amazing person. He is going to be the Savior. He's not just going to be a deliverer that they knew of in days gone by in the Old Testament narrative, but he is the Christ. He is God's anointed one. This one is the Messiah through which the Old Testament heart longed for. He is the Lord. It's one who has valid and empowered authority. This one coming is God. Verse 12. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. The sign here is not so much the wrapping in which the, the babe is conveyed in, uh, but, but the location where they're going to find him. He's going to be in a feeding trough. He's going to be in a place that, that you just don't put babies in. He's going to be in a place that is very unclean. That's the sign. You know, years ago, uh, the first opportunity that I had to go to uh, Israel, just a great life-transforming experience. You ever get a chance to go to Israel to see it? It's, it's really just phenomenal, and I'm thankful for that. And in the course of our tour, we went to Bethlehem. And at all of these holy sites where they believe biblical accounts happen, they built churches over them. Um, and uh, frankly, it's a good thing they did because... Uh, other governments would have made factories over these sites and stuff like this. But, but so anyways, um, there in Bethlehem, over the site where they believe uh, Jesus was born is this massive uh, church. And so we went in there and we went down to where uh, the place was. Bethlehem is, park, is pockmarketed with caves all over the place. And a lot of residences would be built over these caves, and they'd use those natural openings to uh, be able to, you know, help them with whatever they need within their family. And one of those would be stables. And so they believe that the actual place where Jesus was born is in a cave. And so you go down these steps into this large cave area, and there they have marked the place where this manger was, this feeding trough was, where they believe where Jesus was born. And, and so we were all huddled in there as a, as a tour group, and the tour guide is saying things about it and historical things. And then he turns to me, and he says, as he's wrapping things up, would you pray? And I, I mean, it just hit me. I get the opportunity to pray at the very spot where Jesus was born. It was, a, it was just an amazing experience in light of the significance of what took place on that day. Come to verse 13, and, and the scene just literally explodes. Because note verse 13, and suddenly, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, and so, so all of a sudden, there's just this one angel, 
And it's already stunning in light of the glory of God's presence shining. And now all of a sudden there is this multitude of heavenly hosts. And, and that word um, host is a word that is a reference to a, a military contingency, uh, an, an army. And, and the phrasing here is such that this, this number is so expansive, it's impossible for the human mind to fathom. And so all of a sudden it moves from this one angel to boom, it is absolutely a stunning and shocking display and announcement here. And note in light of that, what we see the message that this heavenly army uh, brings in verse 14. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Glory, this is talking about the achievement of God. Look at what God has accomplished here. You see, heaven is stunned. Heaven is stunned by what God has achieved. And what we don't comprehend is what's true theologically is that angels are, are unredeemable. Angels do not comprehend. They do not understand what it's like to experience the grace of God in salvation. And for them to see what God is doing to secure man's redemption and his release is absolutely mind-blowing to them. And so they say, glory to God. Look at what God has achieved. And note in light of what they say that's going to happen because of what is coming here is that there is going to be peace on earth. Peace is what the human heart has constantly been longing, constantly been longing for individually and collectively on this world. And even perhaps this morning, that is true of your heart. In light of all that's going on, what your heart is longing for is the reality and the experience of peace. And he, so he says, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Unfortunately, that little phrase, goodwill toward men, is not the best translation of what the grammar is in the text here. It literally means peace on earth and to men on whom his favor rests. You see, there's a key theological truth here that's being conveyed about the initiative of God. You see, the point is this. Peace is not given to those who have good will, but to those who are the recipients of God's favoring grace. It's about a change in standing before God. That this one-of-a-kind person, this, this Savior, this Christ, this Lord, is going to be able to radically change humanity standing from God, from one of guilt to one of cleansed purity. Well, we go on in verse 15. What we see here, starting at verse 15, is the whole tone of the text now changes because there's a sense of urgency and there's excitement and there's a determination here in the life of the shepherds where we read this in verse 15 and 16. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Note there in verse 15 what we see, or verse 17, what was made known to them, they now make known to others. And in verse 18, we read this, where he says, and all those who heard it, what was the result? All those who heard this news that they made widely known, note, they marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. The word marveled means amazed, means to be astonished. And what's interesting is that this is one of the key words in the book of Luke, where he uses it 12 times in the course of his writing. It's used by Luke more than any other New Testament writer. 
used to, to explain and, and introduce. It's a theme that runs through Luke in, in response to the significance of Jesus. That it's only Jesus who produces an astonishing change in people's lives. Well, that's the text. That's the story that we had narrated to us in his own words by the shepherd there this morning. Uh, what can we apply from that as it pertains to the good news of, of Christmas? At the end of the video by the shepherd, we heard how, how he recounted how he, will, he would never forget what the angel said that day. And it was simply this, I bring good news to all people. That means you too. See, the beauty of the Christmas story is that it's not just some ancient story, but it is a timeless, life-changing reality that continues to be good news to people today in transforming their lives, in bringing them from a place of hopelessness to a place of hope. And so, so what is that good news of Christmas? The good news of Christmas is simply this. It still penetrates dark nights. It still penetrates dark nights. As I said, the reference here is not simply to, to the time of day, but it has deep theological undertones to it. You see, for many people today, 2020 has been a very dark year. Physically, emotionally, mentally, financially. People have lost their loved ones, their jobs, their security, and, and, and their health. Does that mean that we should cancel Christmas? We just heard that last song, you can't stop Christmas from coming. But because it's been so difficult for us, what should we do in light of that? What we need to do is embrace this important truth. The real Christmas happens in the darkness. It happens in the darkness. Isaiah, the prophet, predicted the Christmas to come when he said in Isaiah chapter 9, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned for unto us a child is born. See, something's very dark in our world. And something's very dark in us. And it goes clear back to living our life with our backs to the God who put us here. We simply aren't living as we were made to live, which is God's way. We, we have this deadly disease of me called sin. It's ignoring God over and over again. And sin is a killer of everything beautiful, everything that matters, and turns life dark. Perhaps maybe even this morning, sitting here or listening online, you can relate to that. You have gone your own way. You have made choices that you thought would bring you life, but in truth has resulted in a death like death dark existence let me remind you that Christmas is all about taking you from the darkness to a place of light because verse 9 behold <laughs> behold suddenly God intervenes and penetrates your dark world with the good news of a one of a kind rescuer for your life who can change your darkness into light. We also see this truth that the good news of Christmas not only penetrates dark nights, but it pursues people who need it most. Pursues people who need it most. And, and in talking about the shepherds here, perhaps the most beautiful statement in the little video that we saw is when the shepherd says, you know, no one ever chose me. See, he knew who he was. And the point simply is this, the good news of the gospel comes to those who need it most. They know they don't deserve it. Who are these kind of people? 
First of all, there are people who know they are unclean. They know they're unclean. Right from the start, Jesus didn't favor those who expected to, uh, uh, who, who, who others expected them to favor, the religious elite. Jesus chooses and takes the initiative to make himself known to those who know their need because he is the one who identified with your uncleanness. You know, he's not like the Santa in the lyrics to uh, Frosty the Snowman. You know, he knows if you've been bad or good, so be good for goodness sake. A lot of people think that's how Jesus operates. That's how God operates. You get your gift if you're good. And unfortunately, many think that God operates like that with the greatest gift of all, eternal life. And they are tragically wrong. You see, the Bible says this, the wages of sin is death. That's what we get from running. That's what we earn from running our own lives. But, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. See, you don't earn this gift by being good. You don't pay for a gift. Someone else does. And Jesus paid for your heaven by taking your hell on the cross. He absorbed your death penalty for our sin to remove the wall that was between us and the God whose love we need so much. Who are these people who need it most? People who know they're unclean. And people who, because of the weight of that reality, people who are broken. We're talking about the, 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 the toll of this burden of being unclean when you know there is no hope. And all the broken things in your life, the loss, the grief, the guilt, the regret, the loneliness, the fear that is so deep it hurts, all these things are a painful reminder of your deep heart need for a love and a security that you can't lose. And only Jesus can give you that. I love how Isaiah says it again in chapter 61, verse 1. He has sent me, and this is Jesus himself speaking, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners. You see, this season amplifies so many emotions. It amplifies the loves of your life, the joys of your life, and the pain from all that is broken. And broken is hard any time, but it's especially hard at Christmas time. But Jesus comes on his rescue mission to take your brokenness and to restore it and to heal it because of the reality of what it's been like to live life your way rather than his way and to restore your life and to remove that hostility between you and God so that now as you stand before him, you are at peace with God and now can experience not only that truth of being at peace with God, but the peace of God for all the challenges in life. The good news of Christmas penetrates dark nights. It pursues people who need it most, and it produces authentic change. <laughs> when, the, when the shepherds heard that, they didn't just, you know, they just said, oh, yeah, you know, let's, let's get some shut eye here. No, I mean, they were wide awake. Verse 15, it's like, let's go. This is too good to just hold it to ourselves. You see, the point simply is this. The unexpected experience of undeserved grace never leaves you the same. There's a change that only God produces. And in verse 16 and verse 17, we see how they could not contain themselves. And so what did they do? They make this news widely known. There is a rescuer. There is a savior. There is the Messiah who is coming to give us peace. 
And so, so what does the experience of grace make us want to make known? Simply this truth, that there is the possibility of genuine joy. There is the possibility that you can experience true satisfaction. We say this many times here, is that your heart was made for God, and it cannot find satisfaction in anything else until it first finds satisfaction in him. And Jesus came so that you might discover that great truth, that you might have that kind of satisfying joy, that you don't need all of the things that this world says that you need to have to find happiness in, because all of those things are fleeting. But what you have in Jesus is an unlosable love. That there's the possibility of genuine joy. That there is the possibility, there's the reality of a genuine Savior. One who truly does rescue us from where he finds us and sets our feet on a rock and puts us on the right path and gives us the direction and the clarity that we need in our lives to now live life his way and to experience the blessing of living within the parameters of his will and way and experiencing what that life looks like as we make known to others. Look what Jesus has done to me. And this experience of grace not only makes us want to make known the reality of genuine joy and the reality of a genuine Savior, but the reality of genuine peace. Peace. I love that word peace. It comes from the Old Testament word shalom, and it means stability. What's living life your way result in? A very rocky road. It also has the nuance not only of stability, but it has the, the, the nuance of an absence of war. An absence of war. You see, when you go life your way, what you're doing is the, is the most foolish thing imaginable, and that's the, uh, proclaiming rebellion and warfare against the God who has loved you all along. And that's only going to result in turmoil and chaos and, and, and all kinds of, of ugly issues going on because, listen, you're not going to win that battle. And to be at peace with God not only means that you now have stability, but so there is the absence of war. There's tranquility because your heart is rightly related to the one who made you. I like this statement by Paul Tripp. None of us gets our dream in the way that we dreamt it. Because none of us is writing our own story. God in his love writes a better story than we could ever write for ourselves. You see, Jesus can not only dispel the darkness that's in your story, but rather, he can change you in that story. The good news of the gospel is that now you have an opportunity to let him do just that. How do you do that? Ask him to. Ask him to. Let's pray. Father, thank you for what you're doing Thank you for the fact that you are a God who is on mission. And we don't know where the folks are here in the course of their spiritual journey, but in the quietness of this moment, you do. And God, in light of the darkness that some might be really struggling with and the chaos and the confusion, God, give them grace to own it, to say, yes, guilty as charged. Oh God, what I need is the cleansing of your grace. What I need is the renewing of your forgiveness. What I need is Jesus as my Savior, as my rescuer. And so, God, I pray that even in the quietness of this time, people would simply ask you to do what only you can do in bringing them out of the darkness into the glorious light of the good news of what it means to be a child of God. And we'll thank you and praise you for it in Jesus' great name. Amen.
Well, once again, uh, we say this most every week. There's always an open invitation, and uh, we don't know where you are in your spiritual journey. It's been our experience over the course of the years that God does work in people's lives during the Christmas season. And if we can help you in light of questions that you might have, those of you who are watching online, it would be our privilege to do so. We encourage you to get in touch with us at your earliest convenience. Thanks again so much for coming. You're dismissed.